So our speakers this evening, we have my long-suffering accountant, Shane Lowe, from the Accountant Group. Uh, the Accountant Group uh, helped set us up our company back in 99, I think was the first entity registered, and since then have dutifully ensured that I've been organised enough to get off my taxation in place. Shane's going to talk a lot about business structuring and how to make it work in a changing business environment. What I am speaking about is business structures, and why I'm doing that is quite often in the travel industry at the moment, there may be people who are having to get out of franchises or may have been forced into a certain structure because of franchising. So I thought I'd give you some information and if you want further information, you're welcome to ask questions later. So yeah, when you're starting a business, the first thing you need to look at is whether you have the right business structure. Now, the best person to ask is really your accountant if you've already got an accountant. If you're in a business structure now and you have to get out of that business structure because of changes in your business, Again, go back to your accountant. A lot of people will turn around and say, I'll go and see my solicitor, and that's quite good. But as you'll see, as we go through, the main reasons for choosing a certain structure, quite a lot of it's around asset protection, which your solicitor can advise you about, but a lot of it's also about tax minimisation as well. Okay, this is just a disclaimer. Please read it in your notes. This is not official advice. Or when you're choosing a business structure, there's a number of important factors. Your needs, your goals, and your outcomes is asset protection is really important. Most people, when they, they're choosing a business structure, the first thing is tax minimisation. That's really what most people think of your business structures. As accountants, one of our first priorities is to make sure your assets are protected. So your family home and things like that are protected and you don't lose them because your business goes back. So the asset, asset protection is all to do with the way your business is structured. The only protection you can get is by having a company in, involved in. So the person that acquires assets in their own name, such as sole trader, they have no asset protection. So I might run my own business. If my business gets in trouble, I can lose my family home. However, if I run my business through a company, and I don't do anything wrong, but certainly you're protected as long as you don't do anything really wrong in your business. Access to any concessions that may be available while carrying on a business, and access to capital gains tax concessions, because most people in business don't even think about capital gains. Anyone out there, they think, okay, capital gains, your shares, your houses, investment properties, things like that. But business is, is what, you know, that's your main income source. So if you're selling your business, you can have a lot of capital gains tax having to be paid on that. But there are a lot of things out there, if, you, if you've got the right structures in place, where you can minimise your capital gains. And in some cases, pay no, no, at all. What assets will the business hold? Uh, will they appreciate the value? Will they depreciate the value? Um, will they immediately generate income? Or will there be tax losses which they can run, you know, offset later on? If you're running the business outside of a franchise and you sell it, that's when you're going to pay capital gains. The type of business assets, which is intellectual property. Okay, This is the main one, goodwill, intellectual property. How do you put a value on it? How do you sell it? But intellectual property isn't really tangible. So it's, it's something that you need to consider that does, may not get sold with the business. Uh, during the operation of the business, you, if you set up you know, a discretionary trust, you can direct the income how you like, as long as the trustee agrees with that. Uh, you may have a separate legal entity to accumulate the assets, as I was just talking about, and you may pay lower tax, uh, rates of tax on the income earned. You go out and buy a business for $250,000 and it's JV Travel Agency down the road. You work it really well. You get some good partnerships going with um, Rubens XML. <laughs> and all of a sudden, five years' time, you're making a lot of money. The business is worth a million dollars. So you want to sell that business. So you've got a $750,000 capital gain there. How do we do that? How do we minimise our tax on that? We can't do it after five years. You have to do it with some forethought. When I said before about having a company, that's good for asset protection, but is it good for tax minimisation? Well, in some cases it is for immediate income, but for capital gains it certainly isn't. Well, how am I going to think of all those things? Well, you go and talk to your accountant about it. They will sit down, they will talk to you, and they will point out all the important parts that's important to you. Because I could turn around and say asset protection is the most important, but if you don't have any assets, it's not important to you. Or I could say tax minimisation is most important, but you may be building a business that you want to sell off once you've you know, made some money, so the capital gains issue is really important. So raising capital, look, these aren't, some of these topics aren't going to be relevant to some of the people in the room. 
but sometimes they are. So you might be going into a franchise or you may be going into a business, a joint venture with someone else. So it's always important to have a look at the way you're going to raise the capital for that. So the four main business structures are there's a sole trader, there's a partnership, there's a company, and there's a trust. Sole trader is not a separate legal entity, you are the legal entity. Simple as that, and you're responsible. Again, it's not a separate legal entity, it is a partnership between two legal entities. Now it doesn't necessarily have to be two individuals, it can be two companies, it can be a company and an individual, it can be two trusts. There's all different ways a partnership can be structured. Quite often, a, a partnership's fine as long as you've got the two entities that are coming into the partnership set up the right way. That's the important part. So the advantages of a par partnership, they're very cheap to establish. It's a matter of getting on the computer, structuring, applying for an ABN, and you've got it done. However, the partnership agreement is really the legal document that's going to come back and haunt everyone. So if you are going to go into a partnership, have a solicitor, not an accountant, draw up your partnership agreement. It's really important if you're going to go down that path to have the right partnership agreement set up. And Gary decided to run off to Brazil with an 18 year old model and, and borrow a half a million dollars through the business. <laughs> he, but he borrows a half a million dollars in our name. It is not his responsibility. It's going to come on me. And even if I haven't got the funds, I'll take my family home. Okay, the next one we move on to is trust. Trust is probably one of my favourite uh, entities to set clients up in, but they're still probably the preferred method for, a, for distribution of income, where you can spread it out amongst a lot of people, or different entities. The individual or whoever's getting the distribution from the trust pays tax at their marginal rates. Okay, discretionary trusts are exactly that, they're discretionary. <laughs> the income is distributed at the trustee's discretion. So if you're the trustee, it's your discretion. Uh, this can be advantageous again, if I'm running my own trust, I can distribute to my wife where I couldn't split to her in a partnership. I can, especially if she's part of the business and she's got an entitlement to, to some income. I can distribute to my children. I can distribute to my children's children, my brothers, my sisters, her brothers, her sisters. And there's this huge family group that you can distribute to. But one of the most important things is setting up the trustee. The advantages I've already gone through, so I'm not gonna go through all these individually. Uh, the, the capital gains tax consequences are exactly the same as before. You get all the advantages because you're an individual if you're getting distributed. And you also get small business concessions. Unit trusts are another form of a trust, but it virtually works exactly like a partnership, but it's safer. A unit trust, you can have, there's two scenarios, this one here, is between husband and wife, effectively. And they hold 50% of the units each, they get 50% of the profit each, they have ownership of 50% each. Now we get to company, and quite often this is another very popular one. And the main reason companies are popular is because of the tax rate. Because it's more about tax minimisation. Now, I was just saying before how companies are really good for asset protection, and they are. But if you're running your business through a company, it depends on who holds the assets for that business. Because if that company doesn't have assets, it's fine. The good thing about it is it, it, it does pay a lower tax rate than individuals that earn over $80,000. It is its own legal entity. It can be sued and can sue, but it is also subject to different laws apart from individuals, the Corporations Act, and there are, I guess the costs are more because you've got to pay annual fees to ASIC, you also have to report any changes on, on an annual basis. So, um, again, access to the limited liability is one of the advantages. Companies are more familiar to financiers and investors. So, you know, if you want to get uh, finance and your business has been operating through a company, they feel more com comfortable with that. One of, the, one of the disadvantages of companies is, and I'll talk a little bit about this, is the, the owner of that company, yourselves, their ability to take money out of the company. Now the only way they can legally take money out of the company is by taking a wage or a dividend from the company. But how many of us do that? Some do, but some take money. Like you would in a normal business in a trust or yourself. You take drawings, you call it drawings, and, oh I need something, I need this, I need that. However, the laws have changed and 
There's real restrictions on companies take, take money from companies. They're what's called these Division 7A loans. So if you take money from your own company, you have to pay it back with interest. Directors' duties and liabilities, as I said, this is no longer a topic. Uh, I've got a little bit on there. They have changed and they are changing. They are making the directors more responsible. Um, direct liability is under the Corporations Act. If they're, the company's insolvent and they continue u using money or trading under that, they're in trouble. Personal guarantees, if you give a personal guarantee as a director, then you are responsible. Also, the new law that's come in, the last uh, bullet point down there, any super guarantee or PAYG liabilities, directors are responsible for. Indirect liability is if you're aided, abetted, or cancelled in the same situation that we just talked about. So if you're aware of it, if you're aware that your manager isn't paying the PAYG, the super guarantee uh, is trading while you're insolvent, you're just as responsible. Ways to reduce the risk if you're a director. Um, use your independent judgment, you know, but use your judgment to, to not trade when you're insolvent. You know, and if you know you're in trouble, don't keep trying to uh, whack away at it. <laughs> keep all your records, as you should be advised anyway. Um, make sure everything's in, on paper. Uh, conduct your due diligence on any new directors coming in. Um, make sure you, 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 you can get directors insurance. As long as, again, Quite often, you're the one that's in the wrong anyway, so you wouldn't be covered by it. Uh, okay, so before change, choosing the right structure, getting back to the start, this is where we started off. Consider the following six issues. The nature of the business you're going into, accessing of the profits, taxing the profits, capital gains tax, financing, retirement succession. These are the main things that you need to talk to your accountant about.